I just wanted to start off, I, I don't know if you, any of you have ever seen a ghost before, but I don't believe in ghosts, except I had this one thing happen to me. I had a house in Long Beach, um, and uh, my, my daughter was about three at the time. And you know, I was late at night working on a presentation, much like I did last night for this one. And uh, at around 11, my daughter walks in, and she says, hey, there's a man in my room. And, you know, she, first of all, she wasn't putting complete sentences together yet. And she usually talked about things like ice cream and unicorns. So it kind of freaked us out. So I went in her room, I checked. I'm like, oh, honey, there's nobody in here. You know, it's fine. But by the third time that happened, my wife was really freaked out. And she called our neighbor, who instead of blowing it off like I was, like, ah, oh, don't worry about it, my neighbor was like, oh, yeah, there's a ghost in this area. In fact, I just shooted away from my house yesterday, which is probably why it's in over there. And she comes over. Exactly what I didn't need at 11 o'clock at night when I'm trying to do this thing. So, you know, they do something, the ghost is gone, I'm working on this presentation, and my neighbor comes over and she says, hey, what are you working on, an IT presentation? You know, I used to do IT. And I was like, no, no, listen, you just need to leave, right? <laughs> and, uh, and she said, listen, if you want that ghost to go away, <clears throat> you have to stand in the middle of your living room and tell it, you know, to go away in a very firm voice. And I said, all right, well, thanks for your spell, or whatever that is, but you need to go. So, that night, you know, later on that night, I'm sitting by my couch, and I swear to you, I felt something just whoosh by my head. And I almost dropped a dookie in my pants. Like, <laughs> that's how scared I was. And the next thing I w <laughs> found myself doing, I was in the middle of my living room saying, like, please, just leave. And why do I tell you this story? It's because I, I got to tell you, like, we've been doing digital transformation for a while as Zentors and, and as other roles. And about 10 years ago, when I used to go and talk to people about cloud and tell them they were real, I got, a, I got this reaction from CIOs saying, yeah, they're there. It's OK. We're going to be fine. This cloud thing. Now I, I meet these CIOs, and a lot of them are just like, oh my gosh, what's happening? And uh, we, in fact, have met a lot of these CIOs who I just got done with a call with someone I've known for about 10 years. And this person sort of got relegated, and he was like, look, I was busy keeping the lights on, and then they went and hired a chief digital officer and moved half of my revenue and my spend over to this person. And so now I'm kind of been put in a corner. And so you know, to what Larry was saying, the rate of change is huge. Cloud is here, right? Nobody's debating that anymore. Um, and we are seeing the rise of IoT, big data, and analytics. And it's changing our behavior, right? How many of you have kids? All right, how many of you are worried that they're spending too much time in front of a screen? How many of you take your phones to bed with you at night? <laughs> yeah, it's a little hip hypocritical, right? <laughs> we are connected to a computer now. And if you couldn't find your phone this morning, you would freak out, right? And that's the new behavioral change. The rate of change is not only faster, but the decisions we're making have far more impact, OK? Because it's fundamental to the business. And I've made a lot of these <laughs> decisions before. Uh, in fact, so I used to work for um, this wealthy billionaire uh, in, in, uh, in Southern California it, who made his money in the pharmaceutical world. He actually beat out Elon Musk for wealthiest guy in SoCal, except Elon Musk is back with the Tesla. And uh, his name's Patrick Soon Xiong. And Patrick probably got confused one day and hired me, thinking I could help him. But uh, I'm not here to talk about Patrick's mistakes. I'm here to talk about mine. But while I was over there, um, you know, we built one of the first hybrid cloud platforms, right? And we had about 40 business units, uh, and we were in the pharmaceutical space. We were doing genomic modeling, uh, genomics, we are doing molecular modeling for drug discovery, a lot of complex things. And um, we ran into this problem where we had to build this platform, this cloud platform. We made the mistake, somebody above me, of hiring one of the big five consultants. And I'm not trying to down one of the big five consultants, but you know, three months in, we're just getting buried in paper and PDFs. You know, six months in, a year in, and we just had a bunch of binders of stuff, right? And one of the first things that they wanted to do was, hey, let's go and talk to all your business units, 40 business units, to find out what they want. It's that whole Henry Ford thing, right? If I went to them, asked them what they wanted, they wanted a faster horse that ate less grass. They didn't know what they wanted. And this is one of the mistakes we used to make. We, we, used to, we still do this. We go and gather all the requirements, right? Like we're going to build something. And when you're building cloud, you're actually building services. It has nothing to do with the amount of features. Nobody here is going to a restaurant because it has the most items on the menu, right? You're going there for a specific experience, whether it's a buffet, fine dining, what have you. And so we really had to figure that out. And so one of our biggest failures was really how do we fundamentally change the experience and drive the adoption rate? The second one was alignment, and I'll talk to you that, about that in a little while. But 
we have to take a different approach to digital transformation if this is going to work. So we actually figured it out there. We built this cloud platform. And we realized, I'm like, wow, we had billions of dollars. We had a lot of ponytails that we could put to work to code some of this stuff. How are other companies doing it? Right? So uh, I then went and developed this and said, hey, can we take this out to other enterprises? So built this at a partner, grew it to about a $100 million business, won a lot of accolades, actually met Chuck Robbins from Cisco, who said, hey, we only have two partners who are actually doing this. Can you help our other partners? That germinated the idea for us to go and start Zentors. Um, which we did. And Zentors is a digital systems integrator. We don't sell product. We consult with companies um, to, for these digital transformation initiatives. And we also partner with VARs who have phenomenal client relationships. And I want to make this point because we do not partner with a lot of VARs. Uh, we actually only partner with five. And the reason that is is a lot of VARs come to us and tell us, hey, we're ready to change. We want to make this digital transformation. But what they say and what they do are generally two different things. There's a big gap. So we're very happy, very proud to be a partner with C-Store. C-Store is a phenomenal organization. They're, they're small, they're nimble, they're scrappy, um, and their leaders are, are generally aligned right, as to what they want. And they know that they have to make this turn, this digital transformation turn. And so with C-Store, you know, we've been able to, to have some phenomenal successes. And, and really what we are doing is we're taking a different approach to digital transformation. right? A lot of times. We get caught up in this. <laughs> and I know there's a lot of great product vendors here, you know, Cisco, Silence, NetApp, VMware, um, some great folks here, great, great products. But this was confusing, right? And when I was a customer and a vendor would come to talk to me, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I know they want to sell me something, but how does this fit into the bigger schema, right? It's not that the product was bad, it's like, how do I put that together? And look, we've all bought Lego before, right? What happens when you buy Lego? On the cover is a nice picture, you open it up, there's a bunch of pieces, but there's a guidebook in there, right, to help you put those pieces together. So our first offering, when we first sort of launched Zentors and tried this out, when we, we interviewed about 45 CIOs and they said, you know what, if you could just sort of put it together almost in that, that Lego kit for us, that would be great, uh, or, or sell it to us almost like a converged infrastructure, it's all put together. That's what they said. <laughs> then we built it. When everybody talked about it, not a single one bought it. This thing hit the skids faster than a Scaramucci. It was done. 90 days, <laughs> we had to get rid of this. It wasn't working. Why? Because there's two fundamental forces in an organization, right? Innovation stall, and I'll talk about that in just a second here. You guys have probably seen this. This is a, this is a graphic that Gartner put out in about 2015, late 2015, early 2016. Here's all the reasons why projects failed. I worked at a VC for a long time. Uh, we used to release all these graphs and charts. Most of this stuff's BS because we're outside looking in, right? Um, and there's two reasons, really, major reasons why these big initiatives fail. One is sunk costs. Like, hey, thank you for that big jump start thing that you put together, but I just spent $5 million on this platform. I'm not just going to switch over to another platform. You've got to help me make this work, right? That's sunk cost. We've got a fighter jet in this country that we, <laughs> we keep continuing to pour money into. And we're hopefully you know, getting it over the hump. But that this is what we do. We, we like to throw good money after bad. The second, though, and the biggest one, is alignment and consent. Can the leaders agree to what's actually going to be doing, what's actually um, going to come next? In two, it was early 2000s, there was this great news we covered that said BlackBerry versus Nokia. Who's going to battle it out to be king? Three years later, neither of them were around. This thing took it, right? The iPhone just came and swept them. And imagine being in a boardroom of Nokia. You could hold a competition in your hand. You could be like, listen, guys, why do we have a keyboard on our phone? These guys are crushing us. They don't have a keyboard. But in that boardroom is a, is a is a chairman or, a, or an executive who's like, wait, I've got 200 engineers here. I've got another 2,000 in Thailand. I'm not going to skinny down to a 13-person team to build a keyboard, because in a corporation like that, more people reporting to me is power. And this is what happens. These small water cooler conversations are what kill and crush any of these digital initiatives. right? And so we took this framework, and we adopted this from, um, from Microsoft. This was initially actually developed at Harvard and then brought into Microsoft. And we use this, and I'm not going to all of, you know, in minutia, but we start with this envisioning engagement. And the envisioning engagement is to align the leaders. It's not about AWS versus, you know, uh, Amazon or VMware versus OpenStack. What are the use cases? What am I really trying to solve for? Can I get the leaders to align, right? Because if I don't, then everybody else is left to fight bloody, unwinnable battles. Once I align around that, around use cases, you know, what's helpful, then I can move into this design phase. What we say is in engineering, there's 10 ways to do something, usually three good ways. What are those good ways? Then we build it, right? And 
you, we can't stop there. How many times have we been in a place where we're like, wow, we built this wiki or this SharePoint or Quad, and nobody's using it, right? It's not because we didn't build it correctly. It's because we couldn't drive adoption to it. And that's that launch phase. You've got to spend a lot of time in that launch phase driving adoption, driving the velocity of adoption to that platform. Again, that was one of the big failures and the lessons we learned. So I want to talk to you about uh, one of these projects we did. We, it's a financial fortune 100, a big insurance company in the East Coast. Uh, they were established, I think, in the early 1900s, and they're realizing if they don't have a mobile app, they're not going to get any millennial customers, right? Not a single one. And so now we're helping them kind of retool their apps. The thing was, it was taking them 18 months just to get an idea from prototype out to production, a feature out there. That's a long time, right? You know, Larry threw up a, a stat there. If the external rate, right, if the, if the outside world is changing faster than the internal, the end is near. And so... What we did was we got in and we, we developed, we helped redevelop their platforms. This was a DevOps project where we came and we found out what their major use cases were. One was something called instant developer environments. Developers were getting infrastructure, but it was still, still taking them three to six weeks to tool up that infrastructure before they could commit code. So we narrowed that down. And now we're helping them rebuild the application platforms for them. Um, you know, it's on AWS. Uh, we're using things like HashiCorp, Terraform, and Vault. We're using Docker. Uh, we're using something else called Black Duck and uh, Veracode for static code analysis. Because a lot of times when people think about security, uh, folks are not coming in through your firewall, right? They're coming in and finding a vulnerability in some code package and installing WannaCry across multiple servers. And so code security is very, very important today. And this is a big insurance company. They're, they're very sensitive about that. At the end of the engagement, um, we were actually able to take them down from an 18-month product launch now to six-month product launch, they can now launch a feature in less than 30 days. So a developer who has an idea for a feature can push that in, and it can get into production in 30 days. And that's a huge win for them. They are much faster than any other insurance company in their, in their patch. Right? So this, is, this was a great, great project for us. And the way we started was you know, we started really by defining the use cases. Right? Hey, as a developer, I want to do something with my system. Like, What's that story look like? But then you take it down a level. And I say, hey, look, developer wants to get into a catalog. You know, it's a great mustache for a developer, by the way. But uh, <laughs> VM, app stack, you know, do I clone it or modify it? How does it get all the way out? It's still pretty high level, right? But I could explain this to executives, sort of get ex alignment of the executive layer. But then I got to go talk to the architects, right? Hey, when I said a, a portal, I meant, you know, clicker web portal. I meant, hey, this is the application blueprint. If I'm going to go into sandbox, you know, I'm going to follow that workflow on the bottom. If it's, if it's an existing environment, I'm going to do that workflow on the top. We take it even further. Hey, I, when I said a blueprint, I meant this kind of version of Java. These are the ports that are opened. This is the .NET version. And the whole point of this is now, the person who's configuring this and the hands on the keyboard and the executive, when they're talking about instant developer environments, which is what this use case was, everybody's saying the same thing, right? There's no daylight between what the VP is saying and the person doing the configuration. And that speeds up implementation. Then we take it and we figure out, hey, what are these components? What do I need for this? So this is a verb-noun association. The verbs, those are the things I want to do. The nouns, those are the things that I'm doing them with, right? IT service management, software-defined networking, source version control. And really, this verb-noun association helps me get away from this. Um, it, it makes it easier for me to be able to evaluate products, right? So I can then say, hey, look, these are the products I need. These are the functions that I want, right? So I'm not really beholden to a vendor to tell me what I should be able to do with this. I come to them with my roadmap and say, these are the things I want. And I can kind of evaluate these products across uh, you know, and figure out which one I want to be able to take on. And really what we do is we map all this into a much bigger project plan. right? It's cloud management, network services. The stuff in green, those are the things we're going to do phase one. The stuff in blue is phase two. The stuff in gray, it already exists, so we don't need to touch it today. Right? But right now, I have an overall map of what I want to do. And really, this is how we take things into production. right? So gone are the days where you go in and you try to build this big battleship, you gather requirements for two and a half years, and then try to launch something. Right? You need to be able to launch an outcome in three to six months. Right? Once you get that, then you can drive adoption with your teams. And so we espouse this methodology where we first build a prototype. We get developers and infrastructure teams on this. And we make sure that that's something that they like. Then we build a pilot, a minimum viable product that's actually going to move out and, and eventually iterate into production. And you get teams who used to take six months, 10 months to develop a service, now down to six weeks. Right? We did a, a, a big financial here on the, on the West Coast. And 
Um, you know, we started with two use cases, instant developer environments and, and data services. They're up to 17 services now in less than a year, right? So the velocity of these, uh, these IT teams increase very quickly. And we espouse two different types of teams. So there's feature development teams that developers are building features for. And then there's infrastructure development teams. What is an infrastructure development team? So I can go to um, a development team and say, hey, roll that code back three versions. If you go to a network team and you say, roll the network back three versions, they're going to look at you and be like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> That's how they talk, by the way. That was a quote. <laughs> um, because we can't roll the network back three versions. That just doesn't work like that. And what they do, you're still doing this thing, actually. I, mean, I know we've all been on these cutovers before. We're like, hey, something's not working. Your network engineer is like, hang on a second. Try it now. <laughs> You're like, yeah, it worked. What did you do? Oh, I made some firewall hole, or I put something in a host route. Yeah, that was great when you had 300 servers. When 300 servers became 3,000 VMs, that was tough. 3,000 VMs are about to become 30,000 containers. Good luck, right? You're not going to be able to go manually change these things. This is the new world, right? Infrastructure is code. Development teams and infrastructure teams are going to work together to really help push out new product, because at the end of the day, it's how do I differentiate my business? How do I get features to market faster, right? So that was a big company, right? Multi-billion, $40 billion company. This is a much smaller company, medical health exchange company, South Florida, um, about a $500 million company, maybe four, 300 people, much smaller, sort of the mid-size. What they found was they were pulling in claims from um, providers, right? Healthcare providers like clinics, hospitals, et cetera, and then normalizing those claims to give them to payors, insurance companies. What they realized was, wow, we've got a treasure trove of data over the last 10 years. So we helped them with a big data project. We built a Hadoop cluster with Flink uh, and Kafka. These are sort of real-time components to it. And really, the whole point of this was this company, this health information exchange, can now go to the insurance company and say, I've got 10 years of data across 30 providers and 40 to 50, 40 to 50 payors. You can actually use my platform to build a better risk pool. I have better tools than you do, better visualizations, and now they're able to monetize their data and sell this back. So this has been phenomenal for them. These, not only that, they have, a, they have a mobile platform where people and doctors can actually tell how, how they can drive better patient outcomes, what are the better insurance providers for their patients to be on. So they're providing a much better experience, not just for the patients, right, but also for the doctors and the providers. And the insurance companies are able to at least see hey, yes, I want to make money providing an insurance plan, but ultimately I do want to have satisfied customers as well, right? And this is really helping facilitate that. So this has been a phenomenal project. Um, it's been about a year or two in there. And now you have things like loyalty for patients who go to the same providers and things like that, and, and they can get better treatment. So a lot of new use cases open up um, for, for this company and these patients and providers. Last one I'm going to talk about is this great cloud uh, migration uh, project that we did. So we had, a, we had a, a customer, and they were building a helium drive. First, I was like, why would you put helium in a drive? But helium is lighter than air. The drive can spin faster at 50% less energy. And, um, and therefore, you know, it's a game changer for service providers who are still kind of using a lot of disk, right? So when we went in there, what they had done was they lost uh, access to their supercomputer. So they had gone out on Amazon and really just made a mess, right? And um, they had built out about, they had about 50 data scientists. They were spending about 500K a month in AWS, and they, about 50% of their workloads were failing. So when we got involved, we really looked at like, how they had built out on AWS, and so we normalized their, their, and stabilized their platform. That's not an easy thing to do, by the way, in AWS. So that was the first layer. We stabilized it. We took 13 VPCs and availability zones down to four in Virginia and Japan. And then on top of that, we put a performance layer so they could turn it up or turn it down at any time. Now, a job that used to take 30 days, they could do in a day, or a job that maybe take eight days, they can spread it out, right? So they have, they have basically a lever as to how fast they want to go. Finally, we put in a security layer, because everybody, or a pricing layer, because everybody knew where all the, uh, uh, everybody had access to everything. The pricing layer was able to then take advantage of things like spot instances, reserved instances, et cetera, and lower their cost by about 30%, as well as secure the data, right? Because of this, they're able to launch a 90,000 core um, supercompute on AWS. It's the largest supercomputer to date. They call it Gojira, which is the Japanese name for Godzilla, right? They found out also that they're spending a lot more than they thought they would in Amazon. So now we're actually building a private cloud for them, right? And drawing back a lot of that high-performance compute workload back home, which is really the big part of the cost. So we have a high-performance compute cluster for them. 
Uh, we've got a private cloud for them, and now they have a content distribution network that we sort of left out on AWS. Right? So I just wanted to give you some, uh, some examples of some of the projects that we've done uh, for some of these customers. So I don't know how many of you know who Gary Kasparov is. right? Gary Kasparov was the best grandmaster, chess grandmaster. You can argue Bobby Fischer was, was up there too, but Gary Kasparov really kind of paved the way for the modern chess. And in 1997, he got his ass kicked by Big Blue, <laughs> by IBM. And most people think that Gary Kasparov faded away into uh, you know, obscurity, but it's not true. He's actually developing the next level of chess player. Turns out the best chess player is not a machine. It's actually a combination of human and machine teams, right? They call them centaurs. What they found was machines are very, very good at that algorithmic execution, right? Just flawless execution. But humans are far more creative and have that aspirational thinking. And so it's really the best combination. Um, you know, I know we see this whole rise of the machines thing, but, but the, human, the human spirit, that human aspirational quality is something that's so valuable, right? And combined with the analytical capability of a machine, the things that we can do are, you know, are beyond really our imagination today. Today, we actually have more chess grandmasters than ever on the planet. These chess grandmasters train against these AIs. Right? And what that means is the level of chess now is actually 10x what it used to be sort of the 16th, 17th, and 18th century, where you, you know, if you wanted to figure out to be a grandmaster, you had to find some Russian in a castle, probably, and go and train with them. So these folks train with AIs, and they've taken um, really chess to the next level. And really, this is what we're doing. This is what we do in IT. We are taking the power of the machine and combining it with this human aspirational thinking. And this is really why we started Zentors, right? Inspired by this, the Centaur, uh, we took that name and you know, we put the X in front of it because we really believe in the fundamental human experience. And the domain name was available, which is very important. Because <laughs> nobody wants to email you when it's like a 50 character thing. But, but this is the new digital player, right? And the reason I bring this up is, what are you guys doing for your businesses, right? It's not, this is not coming, this is here, okay? And this stat, which I'm sure many of you have seen, is, is absolutely true. And, and many of you have heard about this, um, from this quote from Bill Gates, which is, uh, you know, we often overestimate the amount of change that will happen in two years and underestimate the amount of change that will happen in 10, right? Cloud, big data, IoT, Bitcoin, mobile, all these, these are driving transformational forces that have happened in the last 10 years, right? Don't get lulled into an action. So, Folks, thank you so much. I love coming here and, and, and meeting up with leaders. Um, we've got a phenomenal day in store for you. We're very proud to be partnered with folks like CISTO who are really seeing this change, really bringing some of this, this new digital transformation to you. And uh, don't become a ghost of the past. Thank you very much. <laughs>